I wanted to do a retrospective, reflective episode on how COVID-19 has impacted human society and how human beings have become atomized, but also how we've banded together, rose up against white supremacy in this country, and instituted sweeping projects of tenant organizing and mutual aid when the state left us out to dry. Us out to dry. Us out to dry. Us out to dry. Today is Tuesday, March 16th. The year is 2021. This is No Easy Answers, and I am your host, Jules Taylor. Today, like all days, I have no easy answers for you. Well, thank you for tuning in from wherever you happen to be listening. My name is Jules Taylor. This is No Easy Answers, and I am delighted to have you with us for today's episode. No Easy Answers is a podcast about philosophy, politics, and the human condition, and we are completely listener-supported. That's right, supported by listeners just like you. So if you like what we do and you want to support the show... Please consider leaving us a positive review on Apple Podcasts. I mean, I I say this at the top of every show because it really does help us expand our reach. I mean, if you take a moment and you leave a few positive words for us there, then the algorithms really kick into gear and they start recommending our show to other listeners who are taking in similar shows. And that is how this show reaches a wider audience. So thank you if you've already done that. And of course, you can also follow us on social media. You know, follow us on Twitter. That seems to be where we are most active these days. And as always, thank you for sharing these episodes with your family, with your friends, with your coworkers. And thank you to all the wonderful patrons who support this show with a monthly donation. Your support means the world to us. And we quite literally could not do this show without you. So, um, today's episode is a special episode because it was completed in collaboration with my friend Pearson at his podcast called Coffee with Comrades. So, Pearson and I thought it was important to reflect on the last, you know, year or so since we are right around the time when this time last year Donald Trump declared a national disaster for the coronavirus. I want to give Pearson a special thanks for facilitating this conversation and collaboration You know, I've been a fan of his show for a while, and I hope listeners uh, will go and check out his show, Coffee with Comrades. It it really was a great conversation, and I had a really great time hanging with Pearson. And this episode will be a simultaneous release, so you can catch our conversation here. And you can also catch it on the feed for Coffee with Comrades, wherever you get your podcasts. And, And a couple other cool things, like Coffee with Comrades is part of the Channel Zero Anarchist Podcast Network and the Revolutionary Left Radio Federation. And these two networks consistently release wonderful content both of these entities are near and dear to my heart so you know i and also like i don't even think there's an episode of revolutionary left radio that i haven't listened to i mean generally that stuff falls in the listen to this immediately category um so when you're done listening to this be sure to check out the channel zero anarchist podcast network and the revolutionary left radio podcast and of course i will leave some links in the show notes to pearson's podcast coffee with comrades and uh both of those networks and other podcasts i've mentioned here so i hope you enjoy our conversation here is my conversation with pearson bolt on coffee with comrades Hello, and welcome to another edition of Coffee with Comrades, a podcast discussing current events, theory, and action through a radical lens. Joining me today is Jules Taylor, a musician, producer, and podcaster living in upstate New York. Jules and I spend the episode chatting about the emergence of new conspiracies, the way capitalism exacerbated this crisis, fueling and profiting off of our ongoing immiseration, and most importantly, the ways that we've fought back. But it's also a heavy episode, where we leave some space to mourn and grieve and contemplate our own mortality. Jules, for, for listeners who may not be aware, could you introduce yourself and tell listeners about No Easy Answers? Yeah, so um, my name is Jules Taylor, and I started a podcast in May of last year in an attempt to sort of restore some meaningfulness towards uh, things in my life that were stripped of me in this new age of COVID and uh, sort of societal restrictions and all of that. I'm, I mean, I'm a musician that's turned into a podcaster at this point because it was just, uh, 
uh, too ethically complicated to continue to perform. Right. And uh, so I started a podcast, and you know, I, I, I no easy answers is I, I, it's, it's a podcast that's primarily it's like basically I think that sometimes answers can be overrated. Like I'm not looking for an easy answer and I'm not looking for a solution. I'm simply looking to investigate and have a conversation that can hopefully uh, maybe provide a sort of new or interesting or useful outlook on topics that are complicated that don't have an easy answer, you know? Um, So some of the COVID stuff I've covered, but like, I think that, at least for me during this pandemic, I've um, gone to a very existential place. It's hard not to, dude. Yeah, it's it's really difficult. And like, I don't know how other people are reckoning with the number of lives lost or death lurking around every corner or being reminded that death is lurking around every corner. Um, but uh, certainly for me, uh, not being a spiritual person, I've had to examine and really reckon with the sort of temporality uh, of this existence and and what that yeah. means and uh, and how might we live with these uh, newfound restrictions? How might we live with death lurking around every corner? Um, so a lot of it is has to do with ethics, you know, a lot of it has to do with um, looking at history. Um, I, I say the show is really like politics, philosophy, and the human condition. Uh, is what I cover, and you can find that wherever you get podcasts. And I got I got maybe twenty two episodes or so at this point, um, but that's that's what I'm doing at this point to sort of restore meaningfulness to life. Yeah, for sure. Um, <laughs> it's definitely you know we live in a, a a reality that is often ostensibly without meaning or purpose, and so you know especially when your your creative outlets are stolen from you, it makes sense to kind of transition into something new. I think a lot of people are feeling alienated from themselves. Like, it's weird to be alienated from your labor, but to be alienated from yourself, to to be a stranger in your own skin with the previous ways of making your way in the world having been stripped from you, it, it's, uh, right. it's a weird position to be in. Yeah, I never thought of it in that particular term, but I think you're onto something there. Like, it is kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's been like walking through life with... Uh, with like buffers, yeah, like 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 a mime, you totally. know. I, I'm people. This is a podcast, so people can't see. <laughs> but I'm like doing like the mime thing. Like it, it feels like you're playing yourself. Like you're playing a character in the movie of yourself, but you're not actually being yourself. Yeah, man. Um, and I hadn't really thought of it in those particular terms until you put it into that you know kind of line of freight line of thinking, and it's really interesting. Like considering it um from from that vector it's real oh yeah. real dispiriting because i think you're onto something there it's right on the nose yeah i mean i i know that like you know recently the new yorker had a cover that was like an animated cover of like a woman sitting at her desk with a laptop open and she's obviously like in a zoom conference and she's holding a martini and she's dressed from the waist up only and in the room there's like scattered fast food wrappers there's prescription pills at arm's length there's uh you know boxes from amazon that are scattered right and it was it was an interesting take that i found on that as folks were talking about how this is simply the repackaging of alienation sold back to you as a relatable commodity like basically the fact that we're all alienated now alien that the unrelatable is made into the relatable thing and so the alienation that we feel is being repackaged and sold back to us as something in vogue and uh it's it's one thing to to be alienated but to have that basically repackaged and sold to you as something cool and relatable uh, as if this is the new normal i i thought it was particularly insidious yeah i think that's absolutely true i mean you know it's kind of a weird thing to think about how capitalism is so adept at adapting to whatever crisis crops up. You know, like that is its. I, in many ways, I, I would say, I, if it were if it weren't such a heinous system <laughs> of of you know uh, exploitation and degradation and dispossession, I would uh, I would say that it's a very ingenious like way of of behaving um, because it can. I can literally adapt to any 
type of circumstance yeah. and and then sell us back our own misery yeah <laughs> and making profit for someone it's fucking bonkers it is dude. man i don't know if um like i've been i've been reading through and listening to some like mark fisher stuff lately i love mark fisher oh my god dude and yeah so i i just saw this um i think he was delivering a lecture called the slow canceling of the future and he talked about how capitalism and imperialism is the highest stage, right? So it like the Lenin thing where it, it, you know, it, it can't ever stay home. Capitalism has to expand out to other markets. And beyond that, you know, the whole capitalist realism thing is that uh, now that it has expanded out to other markets, now that it has uh, left home and has infiltrated, you know, every crack and nook that commodities and markets and high finance have to offer, now capitalism is spreading into our own minds and ways of being in such a way that human beings, every thought or premise or notion or desire has a presupposition of capitalist notions. So human beings, as Mark contends in some of this uh, uh, slow canceling of the future stuff, contends that like we are unable to think or be or, or, or go about any way of being without some capitalism sort of presupposition. Because the ideology is just so like suffused yeah. throughout human society, yeah, yeah that's uh, that's fucking bleak. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> like I don't know, I don't know how else to say it. Like, yeah, you know, it, 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 it's probably, I mean, you know, it's probably true. I mean, it, it's it it sucks to say, but it probably is true. And like, it's it's um, it's dispiriting. I think, especially because you know. I think, and I think it, 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 it's interesting, Jules, getting a chance to chat with you because we're here at this really, I think, historic and and crucial and critical juncture um, in human human history, where this week will mark one year since Donald Trump declared a national emergency in the so-called U.S. Um, and Unless you've been <laughs> living under a rock for a whole fucking yeah. year, unless you've like just, you're just now emerging from like cryostasis <laughs> or whatever, uh, you know the COVID nineteen pandemic has been absolutely ravaging the planet. In the U.S. alone, over five hundred thousand people have lost their lives, and as of this recording, over two and a half million people all across the world have died. And like speaking to that idea of the sort of existential. Um, like moment that we're in it's crazy because in 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 the large part these men women and children are sacrifices at the altar of capital yeah man um you know i i mean it's difficult to sustain a perspective during all of this because one death you can focus on but 500,000 deaths or any number that's like just that large you you kind of lose the, the, the significance of, of what you've lost, how that is a tragedy, and it, we really lack the tools and resources to go through a necessary mourning process as well. Um, so, you know, this is this is something like, I mean, I'm 37 years old. I was 18-ish when 9-11 happened, you know, and, and, and so it's been really shocking to see the way society, like, I, I, I guess what I'm saying is that like part of, I've been very curious about how Americans are so deeply conditioned to rationalize unnecessary death. And I mean, I know that's a, that's a deep question again, like no easy answers. Right. But like part of what I, in my curiosity towards that, I've had to look at um, parts of history that, don't seem like they make a lot of sense in comparison to our current position. Like I, I, I wrote a really long monologue. I turned into an episode about uh, 14th century Europe during the black plague and uh, 19th century civil war America. And, and the two mm -hmm. time periods seem really incommensurate. Like, why are you comparing this stuff? And, 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 <laughs> you know, and, 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 and I, I also like, you know, it's difficult, but, I think that the tragedies of COVID-19, when we look back on this, when it, it, you know, it provided we get through it, um, I think it will hold its own when we compare it against the tragedies of war. And I think that when I went into this space of curiosity of, of, of why are Americans so able to rationalize unnecessary death, um, 
you know, I, I, I ran a real danger of almost like belittling parts of history. And, and what I mean by that is that like, you know, the, it, we lost like 68,000 people in the Vietnam War over about 10 years. And whereas like we have been in the more lives lost than in Vietnam stage since May of last year. You know, like in like one tenth of the time, it it did like, you know, a, a, to an order of magnitude more deaths. So the Vietnam War seems frankly small by comparison to COVID nineteen, uh, and we're passing milestones like, you know, uh, as many deaths as in World War Two that happened around Valentine's Day or so. You know, um, so we're passing these really grim milestones, and we're just kind of shrugging it off, like. You know, the, the guy that blew up Nash or part of Nashville, we just shrugged that off. You know, it's like we're just conditioned to, like, rationalize this stuff. Um, and I guess going back to the incommensurability of, like, you know, the Black Plague in Europe where half of Europe dies and versus the Civil War where so many Americans died, I, I think that there were changes in society that happened after these two parts. And I think that there is a sort of number of deaths that a society can hit um, where if you reach that point, the social fabric will have to shift. Um, and, and so, I mean, there's a, there's a couple of really good books about this. There's like uh, Barbara Tuchman's uh, A Distant Mirror about 14th century Europe. Um, she talks about how after the plague, there, um, there was like this, uh, it gave way to the Renaissance, is that people um, dwelled on their earthly existence instead of putting so much stock in the afterlife and spirituality. So it, it may have been sort of the unnoticed dawn of modern man. Um, and then you have something like the Civil War where, um, you know, all these soldiers' deaths that happened, I mean, these were, these were family members, these were people that were not soldiers, these were just everyday people. Um, people that joined the military to go fight and it was a war that wasn't expected to be as as like no one expected the civil war to last as long as it did or for as many americans to die and it was just a slippery slope into this terrible situation uh as it just gradually escalated and and so in the ways that america changed after losing 600,000 ish deaths um i mean we didn't have national uh, national cemeteries. We didn't have provisions for uh, for widows and children of dead soldiers. We didn't have all of these lasting institutions um, out of the responsibility of civil war death that were formed. So, like America as a nation became a, a, a more solidified and centralized nation out of taking on these obligations towards civil war death. And so, this amount of deaths that happened in the civil war drastically and arguably shape the United States into what it is today. But it's interesting thinking about how, like, the capitalist class has, has absolutely abdicated that responsibility to the, the nation state, right? Like, it, it's, it's, it's fascinating that even as um, people are continually asked to risk their lives for the profits of the capitalists, that there's no, like... There's no like actual like meaningful conversation going on right now about universal health care, right? Like, yes, there's a conversation going on about it and like electorally, but there's not like a mass movement like building towards it. And and, and I, I say that not to diminish or belittle any of the like hard and committed community organizers who are trying to do that work, but it I think it is fair to say that it it has not reached a um, a, a mass mobilization point yet. And, and, and it's not to say that it can't, but it, it hasn't. And, and if anything was going to do yeah. it, then one would think it would be a fucking pandemic where people were oh literally being asked to go to work in uh, conditions in which they were literally putting their lives on the line so that their labor could be uh, exploited for the, the profit of their boss. It's, it's, it's absolutely ludicrous. Um, the, the sort of docile and passive way that people in this country go about engaging with their just like life generally right um, and and uh, again again it's hard not to be and, and I think we'll, we'll circle back to some of the the more hopeful stuff that's happened this past <laughs> year later but like it, I think it is um, important to like look very soberly at this moment like I think in many ways the reason why people are so 
inured to death is because they don't experience life. Yeah. And there is something to be said about like, you know, the joy and the, the euphoria that comes from truly being alive. Like you are on a picket line, like you are when you're marks marching in the black block, like you are when you are um, organizing mutual aid in the wake of a disaster, right? Like those types of, of really feeling alive, really feeling your like bonds with your fellow human beings Yeah, is it, 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 that's what it means to, to, to be alive. And, and, and I think that, you know, and, and I'm just kind of speaking off the cuff here, but I think that there is something to be said for like the, the dearth of, of, um, of individualism and, and, and the way that it, it, um, anesthetizes us to the reality of death. Um, you know, the, the idea of even communally grieving, right. is something that is so, um, so, so anathema in, in, in the United States. And so it's fascinating that, you know, when you start comparing it to world wars, to, to imperialist wars, um, to civil wars, and, and you look at the, the scale and the amount of, of death that has caused. And to, to a very important point, needless death. Like, yeah. this all could have been fucking avoided very easily. Yeah. Like, there are very easy things that, that um, the, this country, the wealthiest country, the wealthiest empire in the history of the world could have done in order to avoid so much unnecessary suffering. But I think that the reality is, is that, uh, again, kind of circling back to what we were talking about before we actually started recording is that the capitalists don't care about suffering. It's it, 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 either at, at, at best they're ambivalent about it and write it off as just like, well, that, that's just, that's like, you know, that's life. People are going to suffer and either you're going to suffer or you're going to be, you're going to be a winner or you're going to be a loser. Right. Um, but, but like the reality is, is that like people who are, are drawn to community organizing who are drawn to um, revolutionary politics do so out of, out of, a, of a deep commitment um, to, to radical empathy and to, to solidarity um, and uh, understand that an injury to one, as the adage goes, is an injury to mm-hmm. all and that um, none of us are going to be free until all of us are free to self-actualize, to, to um, be healthy, to um, pursue the things that we're um, passionate about and interested in. Um, and, it, and, it, and it makes, in a sick way, it makes a lot of sense that We've been so inculcated with the just awful, heartbreaking uh, ideology that is capitalist realism that we have somehow lost the ability to not only like mourn for our, our, our loved ones who have, have died or our friends or our family or our neighbors, mm-hmm. but we are, are also just unable to live. Um, and and I, th- I know that like, you know, it, that was like a huge thing. Um, during the anti-globalization movement was like trying to like get rid of the boredom of life and to truly live again. And I think that, you know, in many ways, I think that, 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 that folks, uh, organizing and, um, doing, uh, direct action and, and during that time we're onto something is that this, this system under which we live is fucking boring. And, and, and it, 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 it makes it so that like, the uh to to use Hannah Arendt's phrase, the banality of yeah. evil is so bo- it's so boring yeah. that five hundred thousand people died. And so, if, uh, I don't want to say of course people are ambivalent because it's still a, a ludicrous and horrifying reaction. But it makes sense because of the way that ideology has functioned within capitalist society, especially in the imperial core. Yeah, man. I mean, uh, was it uh, Mark Fisher might have said this? He said. Uh... Uh, no one is bored, but everyone, uh, no one is bored, but everything is boring. Right. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like, okay, so, uh, so you're bored, right? Well, capitalism will fix that in the way that capitalism normal, normally fixes things. It's by making the problem worse. So it's like, oh, congratulations. You're not bored now. You're just incredibly anxious all the time, you know? Um, so, <laughs> yeah. Totally. So I, but man, I, I, I so agree with you on all these lines. I think we're both really in agreement that like, you know, it's the underlying conditions which have allowed these tragedies to take place, the lives lost, the sort of callous indifference towards human suffering. And, um, and you know, I, I had this thought the other day. I'm like, how is it that 
I mean, you really got to give it to these people at times, man, because like Joe Biden you is really like, do. yeah, I mean, he's like calling for a moment of silence at the Super Bowl and a candlelight vigil while at the same time denying people health care and not sending out uh, survival checks. I mean, it's something that like the devil himself would do a slow clap for, <laughs> you know, so it's it's yeah, it's it's and they're needless deaths. And um, and so, you know, the, the, being stripped of like. Our, ma- our ways of making our way in the world at this point, um, I-, I think that, at least for me, going to this like very existential place, it took me a very long journey in evaluating all of that to get back to like a very simple point in that humans derive their sense of meaningfulness from the social sphere, and yet we are unable to engage with that social sphere yet we are stripped of that social feel and all coming to the realization that we really need that social sphere to develop meaningfulness but yet we are disallowed access so therein is this constant tension and anxiety rubbing up against each other that like we need the social sphere we can't have the social sphere we're all finding out what's really meaningful to us and what turns out is that people in our lives are meaningful to us and yet we we have to maintain a certain distance uh, at this point. Um, So I I think I took a very long path through some philosophers and radical politics and theory and shit to get to that point. Um, And not that I didn't understand that point beforehand, but it just, it just kind of confirmed a lot of things. Drives it home. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Well, I wanted to also talk with you, Jules, a little bit about like how the media has capitalized on sowing doubt about, for example, the utility of vaccines, right? And in and, and many ways, this has fanned the flames of anti-vaxxer conspiracy theories. Right. Um, and, and what's so macabre and, and nefarious about this is that that sensationalism itself, sure, right? Sure. <laughs> like this idea that we are all going to experience some sort of impending doom garners millions of dollars in ad revenue for social media websites, for mainstream media. And, and I think that the systems of media Media in under capitalism, uh, again, this is a, a relatively like uh, elementary point. Yeah. But the systems of, of media uh, under capitalism are not, of, of course, they're not incentivized by public health. They're not incentivized by trying to keep people healthy or, or mitigating human suffering or um, creating bonds of, of community and solidarity. They are uh, primarily interested in one thing, wh- whatever sort of um, sort of centrist liberal hand-waving or hand-wringing they might uh, adopt. They are primarily interested in one thing, and that is the accumulation of their own profits. Yeah, I mean, so Pearson, I got to tell you, man, like talking about vaccines at this point uh, reminds me a little bit of like some Michael Parenti stuff where he talks about how liberals have to flash their anti-communism credentials before they talk about anything having to do with the social welfare social welfare net like increasing <laughs> or something you know and i feel like if we talk about vaccines um we have to flash our like uh i'm not an anti-vaxxer credential you know um and, and so to sort of editorialize this a little bit i just to say that like i i'm clearly not uh, an anti-vaxxer. I, I don't take those positions. Um, but I, I want to emphasize and my point in discussing this with you about the sensationalism and stuff um, is that I don't think we're having or I don't think it's possible right now um, to a lot of folks to have a really honest conversation about vaccines um, without being labeled something like an anti-vaxxer or something to that end. Um, so just as a personal and why I'm bringing this up and why I'm talking about this and I, and I get it, man, the media, the way they do stuff. I mean, we could talk about that all day. Right. And, uh, and, and I agree with you on all that. Um, so just, and, and bear with me here for just a second. Like, so my, my girlfriend's grandmother passed away uh, a few months ago and, and so there is some suspicion from her family that she died away due to cancer because of the Johnson and Johnson baby powder she was using. Um, so rather than talk about this and sound like a conspiracy theorist, I can give you a link to a New York Times article where uh, it's dated June 23rd, 2020, where, um, you know, basically there was clear and convincing evidence that Johnson and Johnson engaged in conduct that was outrageous because of the evil motive or reckless indifference, i.e. 
capitalism underlying all of it, right? Correct. They've got <laughs> asbestos in baby powder, which is meant to be used on babies, but overwhelmingly, usually it's like a feminine hygiene product, right? So, so right. women are getting ovarian cancer from this. There's billions of dollars of loss uh, of settlement money coming out of that. And there are thousands of lawsuits pending against Johnson & Johnson for this, right? Um, not to mention that Johnson & Johnson is still being sued for um, things having to do with the opioid crisis, right? So I, I don't think it makes logical sense to know this information and yet understand that the government is partnering with Johnson & Johnson for this new vaccine, right? So like... Um, there, there's a reputational uh, sort of hazard within this that I think deserves uh, interrogation. Um, and again, I'm not, I, you know, you tell people trust the science, okay, trust the science, but you can't tell them to trust the history, you know, because the history is full of nefarious things. Um, I mean, people point to a couple different things right away. They point to like the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. Um, there's a podcast called Guerrilla History that just covered something about how uh, when the military was trying to find Osama bin Laden, they were giving out vaccines, but they were really taking DNA information to evaluate from people. They were giving vaccines in the Afghanistan, Pakistan area, looking for a blood relative of Osama bin Laden uh, in attempts to find him. Um, you know, so there's things like that, but there's also like, you know, the... I don't know if you if you were aware of this, but like in 1918, Woodrow Wilson contracted the Spanish flu. You know, like it, it's that he did nothing around that pandemic. He didn't even speak about it. And in fact, like when soldiers at an army barracks in Kansas, which is that's where the actual Spanish flu came from, was out of this army barracks in Kansas. Um, and and those soldiers did not want to be sent overseas on crowded boats to fight in World War One. Because they knew they would catch the pandemic, they would catch the flu, and they would die probably, you know. And they had they called these boats that they were going in overseas to World War One. They call them like death boats or something to that end. Um, but we we've never handled a pandemic well in this country. Um, from Woodrow Wilson contracting it himself, just like Donald Trump contracting it and not getting anything, and then we have this. Um, we have you know Gerald Ford in '76 or so with the uh, swine flu vaccine fiasco that happened, which that in itself formed the, the backdrop and the foundation of the modern anti-vax movement. Um, so all of this is a matter of historical record. And I'm not saying these things, again, I'm not saying these things to sow doubt. I'm not saying these things uh, out of trying to implore listeners to not get a vaccine. What I am saying is that it is difficult and damn near impossible to have an honest conversation about vaccines, which is pertinent to, and germane to all of our lives right now. Um, and we have to facilitate a dialogue around that that acknowledges these things. Um, and so I don't know if you're going to throw me off the show after like saying those things, you know. <laughs> no, I, I think that I think that you are on to something with regards specifically to how capitalism obfuscates what should be a very transparent, a very open, um, a very communal process, yeah. um, of a very, uh, and unfortunately, for better or worse, a very slow process, right? Like of of time to, of like trials and trying to make sure that everything is done in a ethical manner, you know. And, and I think that it, it is um, – it's not conspiratorial thinking to suggest that, uh, again, these people are not motivated by public health. They are motivated by profit They are motiv because yeah. we exist under the profit motive, right? And so as far as I'm concerned, the, the issue is, is less about – the efficacy of vaccines or the lack thereof. And and to me, it's more of a, a larger conversation about how capitalism in particular can be weaponized to work alongside forms of conspiratorial thinking in order to take... Because uh, every conspiracy comes from the kernel of something that, like, has some veracity to it, right? Yeah, that's that, that's the nature of conspiracy theories. That's how that's how they take root. It's how they spread. And so it's interesting thinking about how 
capitalism in particular not only exacerbates the conditions in which conspiratorial thinking is permitted to flourish, but in fact, uh, not only does it exacerbate, it profits off oh, of yeah. those th- types of, uh, of of thinking. And so it's... It, it's it's it, it, I think it is damn near impossible to look at um, this process that we are engaged in without having a sober moment of saying, you know, mom, dad, should I trust the government? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. You know, and and I think that like, uh, I mean, my answer is always always going to be no. Right. Um, it's just that it, the problem here is that. On the one hand, you have people who genuinely want to be able to see their friends and their family again, which is a beautiful and healthy impulse. Um, and then on the other side of the spectrum, you have people who want to get the vaccine out as quickly as possible so that they can continue to make profits because um, they're either they're directly tied to the vaccine or because their be- their business will benefit from people being out and the economy being stimulated once again. Yeah. And so – in a, in a rational or just um, or uh, egalitarian society, uh, we would take as much time as we needed, you know, yeah. trying to make sure that this um, process was done in a way that was transparent, that was um, done in a way that uh, was motivated by public health and by mitigating human suffering. Um, but instead, again, it is uh, – motivated by profit. And I think that um, when you frame it in that particular way, it allows you to not look at it as a conspiratorial thing, but instead to look at it as what are the material conditions from which um, the these uh, current solutions that are being offered to us arise, um, and how might those conditions uh, inspire um, – people to take shortcuts, Mm -hmm. um, to, um, minimize risk. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I think that those kinds of conversations I think are worth having. Um, and I'll be the first to say that I'm, um, really ignorant about, about the science. And so like, I don't want to speak, you know, um, too extensively on the matter, but I think that, um, What's if you if you're interested in having those conversations, like I think that what it, what you have to do is frame it in such a way so as you're talking about um, the conditions of our shared experiences rather than some conspiratorial wormhole uh, where you're inventing lizard people or yeah, you know, doing something man. ludicrous of that. Yeah, like that. I mean, and to be clear, like not only can we not have a conversation, we actually can't even talk about what the conversation should be. And the conversation, in my opinion, should be, what are the side effects? What are the potential hazards of this vaccine? Like, we can't get to that aspect of the conversation before we acknowledge the surrounding elements, you know, like um, like the profit motivations of these companies. Like, like first of all, there are many comp- like like, how are we holding up this company as like a savior for humanity when 10 minutes ago they were, you know, they were a nefarious, conscienceless, uh, profit, uh, motivated, soulless corporation, you know, like, like we are entrusting these same bad actors who, um, can withstand billions of dollars in settlement lawsuits for terrible malfeasance and, 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 and awful, uh, neglect of like their consumer base. Um, you know, it's like that, I mean, I I don't bring up Fight Club very often, but that like if the number of if the number of 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 car crashes and 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 you know uh, malfunctions and the number of deaths times the number of lawsuits doesn't equal more than the profit they can rake in, they move forward with it anyway. You know, it's a standard right. calculation. Um, so so there's that aspect. There's like, I mean, we were just. Weren't we in the middle of an opioid crisis 10 minutes ago as well that, like, these companies are responsible for? And and, and yet, right. you know, here we are. And, and it goes back to, like, the, the Medicare for All conversation that we were having before. Like, not only was the 74, the 1974 Gerald Ford uh, vaccine fiasco, uh, not only did they not, that not, that, that became the, the basis for the modern anti-vax movement. But think about the, the sort of impact that had on the mindset of preventative health to begin with. You know, like that really scarred this country's notions of preventative health care um, in ways that we'll never be able to to, to really quantify. Um, so 
there's a lot surrounding this that we need to be speaking about, and I think that all has to do with having an honest conversation about it and not throwing out, uh, you know, accusing people of being anti-vaxxers. It's that these things are germane to people that we care about in our life that we have now determined are the source of meaningfulness in our lives. You know, somebody said to me the other day, they were like, fuck your politics, I'm burying my loved ones. And that really resonated with me because this is, I mean, what else is important to us other than the people around us and maintaining their health? And if we can't prioritize that, uh, I mean, how can we prioritize that underneath capitalism? There's no profit in that, is there? Um, so it's a dismal state of affairs and I hate to be so fucking dour about all this stuff, but it is bleak and I understand <laughs> it's really super bleak, man. Um, so yeah. 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 I, I also wanted to talk, I'm, we're just going to pour more gasoline on, on the fire. <laughs> That's great. Do it. Do it. Yeah. Cause like I, um, you know, one of my big concerns, um, too, especially thinking about, um, imperialism, thinking about, uh, the sort of, um, like so, especially like forms of soft imperialism um, and the sort of geopolitical kind of positioning uh, of the United States and China um, is, is specifically the Trump administration's reprehensible orientalism, <laughs> right? Uh, of of calling this like the Chinese virus, yeah, yeah. right, and making it making it into this yellow peril sort of yeah. thing, rather than. Um, recognizing if that, that that pandemics happen, right, and and that 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 you can't blame uh, one nation state, you can't blame one um, city or one town. Uh, that the, the reality of a pandemic is that they happen, and, and we can't control them. We can do there are ways that we can mitigate them, but and and there are ways that we can you know stop them by like vaccinating people um, once we've developed the te- the technology to do so. But like that these aren't the the people aren't to blame for this thing happening. It's a it's a it's a random uh, mutation. Uh, you know, it's not something that that anybody can be blamed for. Right, and so. When you position it in that particular way, it, it's a tool for statecraft and for exacerbating tensions um, for the ruling class to, to carry out its geopolitical strategies um, and to, to to employ these forms of what I like what I call soft imperialism. Yeah, you know, I was listening to some random podcast the other day, and it was an interview with a professor who teaches at Yale, but during this pandemic, since he's doing everything remotely, he's living in Vienna. And so he's teaching in the middle of the night, apparently, you know, and uh, so, but he told, you know, he's a guy that said he's traveled all over the world and he's been received as an American in many other countries uh, as, you know, as many different things like uh, I don't know, uh, someone of excess, an American, someone who, however Americans are characterized in foreign countries, uh, whatever the tropes are. Um, But recently, he's been received by people in other countries um, as like an object of pity. You know what I'm saying? So like, so like, that's something that um, he hadn't experienced before. And that's something that was kind of revelatory for me you poor thing you're living in a dying empire. yeah like you poor thing you don't have health care and you don't understand that if you're sick you just don't go to work and there's not such a thing as like sick time in in in, in scandinavia and there's not like you know the double ho- double holiday pay in italy or six weeks of vacation standard and and that there's more to life you know in the way that like in spain you get a couple hours for lunch you know it's like it's part of right. the culture and and so I mean, maybe that's one thing that the internet has really done, which is awesome, is that it's made it, it's made everyone aware of different ways that things function in different parts of the world, and it's made us ask more of our lowly existence as Americans without healthcare or vacation time or a livable <laughs> wage, you know? Right. But going back to the whole you know, the reprehensible Orientalism, man, like I think that beyond. This, this, these fucking jokes about Kung flu and shit like that. Beyond that, I think that we may live to see a time when Americans are, maybe the new trope is that we are carriers of disease. You know, we are, we are just the, the uh, descendants of European settlers who brought disease to America and will carry it out of America when we travel on airlines, you know, like, yeah, yeah there's, um, there's a lot to be said about that, man. Um, but it, it seems like, this is the kind of thing that um, 
like going back to the previous point about the Spanish flu originating in an army barracks in Kansas, like the whole thing is that the there was a Spanish newspaper that was the only newspaper that was really reporting on the flu at the time when this pandemic was when the 1918 pandemic was discovered. And so that's why it was called the Spanish flu, not that it came from Spain. Um, and so, I mean, we're not calling it the Kansas flu, you know, but but. <laughs> so, so calling it the China virus or the China flu or Kung flu or whatever, I mean, it's really awful, and that is going to bite us in the ass. Um, so, I, I think that Americans will be characterized as like uh, pestilence carrying, fucking, you know, just awful shit. That way. yeah, yeah man, it, it's really <laughs> tumbling. We're so cavalier about this stuff without healthcare. It's like not only do we not have the wherewithal to. Um, to bond within class solidarity and rise up and demand these things from our representatives or from our government. Um, but we also are just kind of cavalier and, and bumbling idiots with it as well. So um, it's no wonder that this professor said that we're received as objects of pity. Um, because, if, I mean, honestly, like if I was sitting in a, in a different country looking at America, I mean, that's that's we are like the Florida of the globe. At, at this point, you know, so <laughs> listen, listen, homie, uh, don't come from Florida. That's where oh, I'm, man, from, well, but, uh... I'm from Texas, man. So, I mean, like I, there's all sorts of shit going on in Texas between crews going to. No, oh, I my know. God. Did you see that? Uh, we're recording this like earlier in March. But did you see that um, fucking what's his name? Michael Moore tweeted oh some centrist liberal bullshit yeah, yeah, about Texas yeah. and how they uh, deserve the faith that they get. It's it's wild that. um you know, this 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 sort of smug coastal liberal elitism, like they don't even question it. Like I was sitting, I was sitting um, with my partner listening to a record uh, earlier today, and and just kind of scrolling through Twitter, and uh, I stumbled across that um, that tweet, and I remarked to her, I was like, you know, it's wild that these people don't even take like a moment of self reflection. Yeah. Right. There's no. There's no questioning. Uh, you you can see that like he got ratio. Oh, dude, dude, totally. Like he got this man. This man got absolutely fucking just yeah, obliterated. Absolutely. Um, in his replies, deservingly. Uh, deservingly, absolutely. But like the the wild thing is like this motherfucker probably just muted it and was like, eh, yeah, whatever. They, you know, it's just it, and and you know, not even being willing to take it to heart. And and it's it's this sort of dichotomy that I think really exacerbates um <laughs> definitely exacerbates my hatred of liberals yeah. from the yeah. left but i think that it also makes a lot of working class folks just kind of turned off to this sort of um <laughs> for lack of a better term like really hateful um cultish uh veneration of of liberalism and i think that it's 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 like watching liberal liberalism die in real time. Yeah. Like you know, again, like Biden fucking, um, you know, <laughs> having a moment of silence at the at the Super Bowl. Like what? Like I can't. It's hard to think of a more quintessential neoliberal moment. Oh, yeah. Than 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 that. Um, and so it's fascinating watching this uh, this moment that we are in just kind of continue to to unfold. And I think that in 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 many ways, that's especially clear when you think about the rhetoric that surrounded like frontline frontline workers, um, people being heroes, like you know, thank our healthcare workers, people putting up signs and stuff for healthcare workers, as if again, or like people who work at grocery stores, as if again, these people aren't being just ruthlessly exploited oh, yeah. day after day after day after day, and if that you really wanted to to, to support these folks. Not only would you agitate for a fifteen dollar wage, you would also want to help those folks get unionized. Yeah. You would want to help those folks demand concessions from their bosses, get paid time off, um, get paid sick leave. You know, uh, it's 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 absolutely um, unconscionable the way that liberalism has inf just infected and inculcated people with uh, uh, such a myopic perspective on the world that we can somehow um, think that, again, holding a sign for some grocery workers or thinking the the bag boy as he take for taking your, uh, you know, groceries out to your, the back of your vehicle and being like, Hey, thank you so much. Like you're doing like a really great job. Like that's not, that's, that, that means absolutely fuck mm -hmm. all to working people. Yeah, dude. Like, 
I mean, I, I suspect Michael Moore probably muted that thread and then called up Keith Olbermann to like commiserate or something, you know? <laughs> Keith Olbermann did the same shit. And uh, I mean, you scratch a liberal and a fascist bleeds, yeah. you know? Um, and yeah, people like Michael Moore, when they, when they espouse these things, man, like I just... I'm so fed up, and I'm also fed up with, like, the symbolic uh, sort of, like, signifying gestures of shit. Like, like the Harriet Tubman thing on the $20 bill. I mean, if you could if you could wrestle Harriet back to life, I'm sure she'd be pissed the fuck off that, like, the money and currency that was used to buy her people and own them as possessions is now marked with her face? Like, how yeah. is that any way to honor her? You know, like, but but it goes back to, like, some of the... It, it goes back to different things like uh, like I don't I don't know if you ever noticed this but like the whole promise of forty acres and a mule mm -hmm. a mule is an animal that cannot reproduce so like they were giving you an animal that was not made to reproduce it was meant to like basically economically uh, uh, bamboozle you at the time when you needed to purchase another mule or a different animal or what have you so like there has always been this sort of symbolic empty gesture horse shit um and 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 you know when i point that out people get very upset at me at times like i uh during the uh the the democratic primaries last year i remember there was a there was a meme about like this kind of uh not an atrium but like this little nook that was like outside of a restaurant and somebody took a giant rock and painted it with a rainbow and put it there. And you know that's a that's a homeless rock. That's like a rock that like is meant to prevent the unhoused from 100%. right. And it's painted like it, with a with a rainbow on it. And and somebody said, "Hey, this rock is basically Pete Buttigieg." And um, and one of my liberal friends got very upset and said that you know by me retweeting that or reposting that, it's displaying a bit of like. Uh, homophobia and and i just was like i was like you know bro I, I love you you are one of my really close friends i love our conversation but politically you and i just don't hold the same world views you know and 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 there is a sort of toxic individualism which is laced throughout uh liberalism as well um and i think that's largely i mean you can you know, that's probably why there's, like, not that moment of self-reflection before someone like Michael Moore tweets something like that or Keith Olbermann. They get ratioed and they don't learn from it and they maintain these individualistic perspectives. And 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 they, under the guise that they have a worldview, when it's not a worldview, it's like they've bought into the American project of capitalist democracy, um, which as we know, like, the end of history is kind of being rewritten into an alternative narrative where it's like... It, you know, democratic capitalism is not like the only way forward. In fact, what we did was we, through Operation Paperclip, we recruited Nazis and housed Nazis and allowed them to reemerge. Um, is right. basically how it went down. And and we all know that fascism is capitalism in decay. So the more that America decays, and the more that this end of history narrative gets obliterated by the contradictions of capitalism, I think we're not going to really see an end to these fascist movements. Um, and and I also think that, and maybe this can tie back together with some of the stuff we talked about, you know, capitalism and the vaccines and things like that, and the kernels of truth, as you mentioned. Um, but I, I really, like, I've been curious about, like, how one might go about developing a dialogue um, with people on the far right. And I want to preface it by saying that, like, I don't think that they're opinions need to be tabled at the conversation. I'm not up for debating people's rights to exist. Um, but I think that there is a large enough number and people, these are people in people's families. These are loved ones. These are people that we care about, right? That have been affected and and brought in by these things. And, and I don't think it's as hard of a path to fall down as people think. Because, you know, someone like Ashley Babbitt, who was killed at the Capitol, right? She was in the military for 14 years. And her beliefs and who she was as a person isn't too far off from like your veteran dad or someone who flies a, a flag in his front yard and hands his son a selective service registration when he turns 18. Like her belief system and her worldview is not too far from the center. It's not as far from the political center as we like to think it is. Um, so, and I think that extra bit that makes Ashley Babbitt go down that route, like, 
okay, so she lives in an algorithmic bubble. She's in the military for 14 years. She lives in an insular sort of Republican worldview. Okay, there's that. How does she get from there to, hey, the Democrats are running a global pedophile ring and they're eating babies and drinking adrenochrome and they're satanic? How, that, that, that leap. From that, you can't forget that they're 16. right. Can't forget yeah, that. Super, can't for, yeah, super yeah, right, right. <laughs> so, so, but I think that extra bit that got Ashley Babbitt and others like her to go down that QAnon path. I think that extra little bit is reality. I think that we live in a tarnished history of true conspiracies. Everything from things we mentioned, like the Tuskegee syphilis experiment to the assassination of Fred Hampton to COINTELPRO and, um, you know, like uh, Building 7 falling on 9-11, uh, the Gulf of Tonkin incident. Like, these are all things in history that are in our history that were revealed to be nefarious actions of our government. You know, like, I live in the Northeast and people come down with Lyme disease all the time and you know, there, there's some there's some books on that that show that you know it 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 came from from an island uh, after a hurricane blew it into Old Lyme, Connecticut. Like it, it was in a government. Uh, anyway, so I'm gonna it's and this is another thing. It's really difficult to talk about American history without sounding like a conspiratorial ufologist, dude. It's funny, like I, it's funny when you like start reading American history and you're you're starting to connect like the dots and you're like, wait a second, hold on. All of this sounds like somebody just made it up. Oh yeah, <laughs> like, it sounds wild. Um, and 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 you know, again, I'm sympathetic to to kind of like thinking about it in the in these ways, but I I, I still I, I I'm hesitant to say that they are you know actual conspiracies more than like Cohen's Pro um, or. Uh, you know the the failure of of like Hurricane Katrina, yeah. like seeing those as as institutionalized sure, failures sure. that were aided and abetted by systems of settler colonialism, of white supremacy, of capitalism, and so to me, like it's 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 it is tempting to think about them as conspiracies or to put them into that kind of a framework, but I think that the the again it comes back to the sort of like mundane banality like, the, the of evil, yeah. of, of yeah. evil right like that that's just how these things end up exerting themselves you know like it was like uh, for me you know one of the things that um was like really like eye opening and 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 um radicalizing was the occupy movement yeah. and thinking about like how that was infiltrated right like seeing um images of cops getting out of the back of police vans dressed as plain clothes officers and marching into uh, a camp yeah. right like again, like again it doesn't take you don't have to take that conspiratorial leap but to me what is interesting about the 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 choice to take that conspiratorial leap is that a it's a reflection of to your point, a lived a, a lived and experienced reality, yeah. just taken to a, another step, and that B, it's again in service of, in many ways, deflecting from what is the more mundane functions of of again settler colonialism, of anti black racism, of white supremacy, of capitalism, right? Because uh, those things are horrifying and 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 all all it's like this hydra of 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 different social hierarchies that have emerged right. into human society right. but they're also like really hard to talk to people about they're sure they're not boring but like they are dense and difficult to understand sure. and so the the allure of of i think conspiratorial thinking is that it can invite us into um easy ways of ex ex explicating and explaining yes. These these much more complicated um, circumstances that are intricately interconnected into a matrix of um, different systems and and institutions and forms of oppression that uh, it would be much easier to just be like, well, it's a satanic cabal that is right, 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 know, uh, an international pedophilia ring. Like I'm, I'm talking to you, and I, I know that you are like a PhD candidate, right? I know that you've done a hell of a lot of reading and studying in your day, and and it's not to say that people don't read or people don't study or what have you. What I'm saying is that like for someone that doesn't have uh, like a command of world history or uh, a fully formed political outlook um, or uh, a sort of cohesive uh, and consistent worldview. Um, 
I think it's much easier to explain reality through conspiracies at that point, oh, 100%. right? Yeah. So I mean, I'm mm-hmm. not I'm not blaming these individuals. I'm simply saying that like I can understand how they make that leap. And and I and I also want to say that they can make that leap without understanding that the place that they're leaping to is deeply anti-Semitic, is deeply reactionary. Um and like so just recently I so I, I posted an episode about like um about the the conspiratorial thinking thing and and I got a really weird response from someone with an enormous amount of cognitive dissonance. Like uh and this was just online. I ended up having to like block the guy. Um but he had a rebel flag in his profile picture. His name was Robert oh Edward Lee, but his backdrop was Vladimir Lenin, and he said, uh yeah, yeah, right. So he was fusing like, yeah, yeah, I know. This is what this is what I'm talking about. It was bad shit, you know. But he started telling me that actually, like, most people see QAnon for what it is, and that QAnon is used to discredit people that have actual information about child trafficking. So wow, like flipping QAnon on its head, right? I mean, inverting this triangle of like reason, consistency. Uh, it, you know, it's yeah. So this is. I understand. Like, you're looking at me, you're giving, for listeners, man, Pearson's giving me a very blank, like, puzzled look right now, and it's hilarious. Um, but so, so, but these are the kind of people that we're dealing with that, like, that, and I, I don't want to say these people, but I'm just saying that if you don't have a command of world history or a fully, uh, you know, fleshed out and developed political worldview, people need a way to explain reality to themselves and others, and, and, you know, things like, uh, you know, it's just leftover Nazi propaganda, like the that the world is controlled by a nefarious group of individuals seeking world domination. I mean, that's just like some rehashed Nazi propaganda. You know, the the yeah, adrenochrome yeah. is just like a rehashed blood libel uh, lie. Um, so, what is old is new again. We, we, you know, it's it's so they're all just rehashed current versions of this shit, and people don't recognize that because again, they don't have a command of history. They've never. I mean, I don't know about other people, but I mean, I sit around like, huh, what are the origins of anti-Semitism? And then I look that stuff up and I read about it and I, and I try to understand the world around me um, because I think that it's important to understand uh, the way conspiratorial thinking operates because it is a key cog in the entire political right at this point. You don't understand totally. conservatism and, uh, and, and the political right um, without understanding the way that conspiratorial thinking operates. Yeah, they're inseparable at this point. And, you know, it, it, it's, uh, again, it's, it's, uh, it's an elementary truthism, but I'm going to say it anyways, that uh, they are beating, they are marching to the beat of a different drum. Like, the, it, it, is a, it is a totally different, incredibly skewed version of reality. Um, and I think that, you know, I guess the last thing that, um, uh, to say that I have to say, at least on, on the idea of conspiratorial thinking before kind of pivoting, hopefully to <laughs> what will be, if not optimistic, then existentialist sure, sure, uh, yeah, form yeah. of hope is that I think, uh, again, you know, the, it is incumbent upon, um, us, uh, as people who are committed to the revolutionary transformation of society into more just and egalitarian and, um, you know, anti, you know, anti uh, hierarchical forms of, of, of social organization to recognize th- implicitly that it is up to us to try and make a better case than these conspiratorial forms of thinking. And it, that doesn't mean that you have to give people a platform. It doesn't mean that you have to, um, you know, uh, that you shouldn't punch it. I'm by, by no means am I saying that you shouldn't punch Nazis. Right, 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 right. It's always morally correct. What I, but what I'm saying is that I, I, I am, um, alarmed by the fact that people, uh, when, whenever a, a, a comrade, well-meaning though they may be proudly says to me, no, no, my, all of my friends now are my comrades and I don't talk to people who are like, who are conservative at all. And I'm just like, or like liberal at all. And I just look at them and I'm like, 
But okay, but comrade, what you're doing is putting yourself into another echo chamber yeah. where you just have an endless feedback loop that is just constantly reifying the things that you want to hear, and you are doing this thing performatively, mm-hmm. right? And if you want to actually change the world, it's going to be necessary for you to to talk to people who you don't necessarily agree with and try and give them a better way of of looking at and thinking through um the intersections of 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 oppression and of injustice that exists in society today because otherwise they're going to fall prey to these more nefarious forms of conspiratorial thinking because and this is I, I said all this to get to this very uh, obvious again obvious <laughs> point is that it's because conspiratorial thinking is easy. Sure. It doesn't take effort. Sure. Right? It doesn't take effort. It doesn't take um, uh, a lot of um, thinking or reflection or unlearning. It simply is here is this faith based thing that you just have to accept. Right? Um, I don't have a lot of evidence. I maybe have some circumstantial evidence. But this is um, what I want you to believe now. And it's a lot easier to believe something than to confront um, your own complicity within systems of oppression, um, to unlearn whiteness, to yeah. unlearn patriarchy, yeah. to unlearn heteronormativity, to unlearn um, uh, all of these to, – to, to unlearn settler colonialism, um, to, to, to decolonize your own mind. It, it is difficult <laughs> – hard work to do that type of thing and the fact that we are so individuated and that we lack um really robust um social community uh with one another especially under a pandemic which has isolated us and alienated us as you said so eloquently from ourselves it's nigh impossible and so it makes sense that in a time where people are looking for answers they're going to turn to the things that are um, easy, quick solutions. Yeah. And you know, it, it doesn't mean that these easy, quick solutions are in any way consistent. Uh, cause like, you know, like it, I, I mean, I've, I've thought a lot about this and part of like me thinking about this was thinking of like, what if I could put myself in someone's shoes? Like, what are these people thinking? You know, there's a, a very unjust and uncaring system of coercion around them. And you're, you're trying to explain away the evils of this world and you look around and you realize, okay, so the nutrients, the nutrients have been sapped out of our food. Okay. And then there's this thing called GMO happening with Monsanto. Okay. Then there's the chemtrails thing. Like if I was a person observing this, what would the natural conclusion be, right? Um, and to me, the only thing I can d- deduce if I was to put myself in that position, right? You look at something like, uh, I don't know, like the Georgia Guidestones or something that say keep the population underneath uh, 500 million or something to that end. Um, and, and, and I would, if I was a conspiracy thinking person, all of that evidence would seem to point me towards some sort of weaponized virus, right? That like, maybe there would be like a culling. If, if, the, if there's a nefarious group of individuals looking to exert world domination, and keep the population underneath 500 million, uh, they would do that slowly and steadily through sapping the nutrients out of food, and, and, and then they would release a weaponized virus. That is maybe the most consistent thing I could think of in terms of a conspiratorial thinking individual uh, when given this existence and obs- observing you know, the world around them. But, you know, the same people that are like, Anti-maskers are the same people who are anti-vaxxers, um, who are the same people who are COVID hoaxers, you know? So, like, the fact that these conspiracies can exist side by side, the sapping of nutrients in the food, the GMOs trying to, like, uh, lower your immune system, the, uh, the, the, the notions of vaccines being evil things that, uh, that will harm you or cause that autism, the, all of these, these conspiracies... It seems like, why aren't conspiracy theorists saying like, oh yeah, we knew this COVID thing was going to happen? Because that seems like where it points. <laughs> I didn't know where you were going with that until just then, but that's, uh, that's funny to think about. Like, yeah, and so like that's the only, <laughs> But yeah. your point is, your uh, the point you're, I think that you're trying to make, right, is that like they lack, it, it's not connect, they're not actually, it, well, it's 
they're not thinking it through as a as a consistent worldview. Yeah. It's literally just like this reactive yeah. um, sort of input. Um, it's not. It's never really reflected upon. Right. Um, it's the recycling and the regurgitation of things that they've heard over and over and over again. Right. And and the insular nature of their communities makes it to where these uh, these dissident notions can exist side by side. Um, and, and that is, um, and be unchallenged to where you end up talking to a guy that, you know, is, uh, goes by Robert E. Lee online with Vladimir Lenin as his backdrop. <laughs> you know, it's like these, these, these <laughs> dissident things exist side by side in a way that they uh, only these dissidents in a way they only can within the mind of a conspiratorial right. thinking. There's no consistency to it. And, and that's the thing. Like right. if I met like a consistent conspiracy theorist who presented a cohesive sort of theory as to why this is going down. I mean, it's almost like it's almost like in the same way that I think communists can make a better case for Republicans than Republicans can make a case for themselves. Like if you wanted to if if, if you asked me to argue for family values and a strong family nucleus and small government uh, not infringing upon liberty and uh, and, and and other sort of conservative notions, I, I can see their points and I can see where they're coming from. And I think I could probably articulate that better than most Republicans can. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't have to. That's the whole thing. You don't have to articulate it well. It's virtue signaling. Yeah. It's performative yeah. bullshit. Yeah. It's not meant to actually articulate right. a fully um, robust worldview. What it's meant to do is obfuscate the material functioning of capitalism. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's what all of this is: is that they're they're willing to blame, uh, you know, a small group of nefarious individuals that are satanic and baby eating and drink adrenochrome and all that shit. They make the stuff up when it's just capitalism, man. It's just it's just capitalism. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, I mean, and that, again, it, that's not to to belittle or um, you know overlook the many different types of social hierarchies that emerge right. out of and because of and alongside of and predate capitalism. It just means that capitalism is a capacious category that is capable of utilizing and um, flowing and util like manipulating and weaponizing all of these different forms of. Um, injustice and oppression. Yeah. Um, but before, before we part ways, <laughs> I do want I do want to maybe try to leave okay. on a hopeful note. I'm not entirely sure if it's possible because yeah. of again the bleak reality. Uh, you know, in some ways it, it feels um, in, in in some ways it feels almost insensitive to say that like. Well, um, you know, it's been a, it's been a a, a good you know. Um, commiserating sesh, but let's, let's <laughs> positive note. Like that just feels like really insensitive um, and and uh, tone deaf to the reality of the fact of of like the the moment that we're in. You know, again, over five hundred thousand people have died in this country alone as of this recording, and two and a half million people have died all across the world. And it is really difficult to just hand wave that away and say that well, there's a silver lining. Like that's I would say that that's like anti-human, like, sure, it, sure, and and, and not uh, something that I'm interested in. Right. What I am interested in, though, is the emergent ways in which this year has catalyzed ruptures sure. in society. Sure. And I think there are many. Um, I think that there have been incredible unionization efforts. I think that there have been beautiful flourishings of of mutual aid. Um, I think that uh, human beings have found uh, ways of connecting with one another um, uh, across uh, time and space, um, despite the fact that uh, they are alienated and isolated. But I can think of nothing quite as spectacular and as um, heartwarming and as um, hopeful as the George Floyd rebellions that happened this past summer. Oh yeah, and 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 and, and I think that uh, it's impossible to um, do a one year retrospective on COVID nineteen and on quarantine without talking about the Im imminence and the importance of that moment um, and how. In many ways, this could happen because of the coronavirus, oh, yeah. right? Because people were stuck at home, because people were looking at their phones all day and not at work because either they were out of work or because they had been laid off or because they were on furlough or what have you. But people had the time to actually give a mm -hmm. shit um, and, and, and to 
grieve together publicly, right? And to not just only grieve together, but also fight together publicly. And I think that um, the coronavirus opened up space for that to happen. Um, and, and that's not, in, again, in any way, shape, or form to erase the long and storied history of, of black resistance to white supremacy um, and of black organizing against anti-racism and against anti-fascism in this country. But it is to say that there was something very particular about this moment and about this man's death. Um, and, and the many other people who died this summer, including Breonna Taylor, um, Tony McDade, and Tallahassee, where I where I live, um, you know, there are uh, th- th- these 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 folks became a rallying cry to fight back against the forms of white settler colonialism um, and white supremacy that have permeated uh, the U.S. since its inception, um, and it, it is incredibly inspiring to look back on this this past year in with that particular lens and to think about the fact that abolition and um uh fighting against the police and and um the police being you know uh tools of the the powerful to um divide and segregate us is not some like fringe left thing anymore like that is a very popular sentiment that has that has totally transformed the zeitgeist um and it is it is that was unthinkable oh yeah a year ago yeah the the overton window has definitely moved in a way that is uh that was transformative and gave rise to what we saw this summer i mean you know, as a source of optimism, man, I mean, I think this new generation of abolitionists is, is fucking amazing. I mean, they're like, we don't want to reform prisons. We want no prisons. We don't right. want to reform immigration. We want no borders. You know, like, right. like it's really inspiring to see uh, folks come forward like that and take these stances. And, and, and the funny, you know, I, I'll tell this was like, you know, my girlfriend's mother, man, after I, I was out all summer protesting and uh and the funniest thing when i when i told her i was out doing that she was like well thank you for your service (laughs) (laughs) yeah i was like that's i was like you know thank you for supporting the troops you know um (laughs) but um but yeah no i mean that was probably the most hopeful thing uh for me that's happened all year um in that you know, you really got high off the people when you were out there, man. When you're part of that crowd and your voice is being heard and, you know, I, people aren't afraid of the cops at this point. I mean, if you look at Portland, I mean, you get... They fought cops for 120 nights straight. Yeah, man. I mean, you end up getting gassed a couple times and after that you're like, oh, I'll get gassed. Okay, sure. And then you're just like kind of not afraid of the cops anymore, you know? Um yeah. And, and I think a lot of people went home and Googled the words like, uh, uh, what is a police kettle, you know, and, and learn what right. that was. Um, and and I, I think that during that entire time, it gave me hope and optimism. And, it, and it's just funny that, like, I think the singular moment of hope and optimism was when they torched that police precinct in Minnesota. Oh, my God, dude. Yeah. For fucking sure. Oh, oh my God. I was just, just I was pumped. It was like the first time you read Lenin and you're just, like, standing on top of your bed, like, just, like, you know, like, reading <laughs> State and Revolution or something, you know? It's like you just get so fired <laughs> up about it. Um, but, yeah, definitely the, um, the, the protests this summer were uh, a, a source of, of hope and optimism and— um, and you know, I, I think as soon as the weather permits, man, if it gets a little warmer, I think these uh, these things are going to continue this summer as well. I think they are as well. I think it. I think it is. You know, I've been doing this now for oh God. I'm old. I'm getting older and older, uh, <laughs> obviously. Um, but like, it, I've been doing community organizing now for well over a decade, and it's like. Oh, so this is just like this is a, this is, this is the normal ebb and flow now. Yeah. Like especially like over the, like the last three or four years, it has been every single summer shit pops off. Yeah, Wh- whether it is doing uh, abolish ICE campaigns, whether it's doing occupations of immigration facilities, whether it's doing anti police organizing, right? Whether it's doing um, quarant or uh, not quarantine, uh, doing disaster relief yeah. um, in the wake of hurricanes, yeah. right? Um, every single summer has had some crazy uh, uh, life-altering kind of event, 
and more and more people are getting um, turned on sure. to this type of work. And and I think that uh, it's 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 only to be expected that some unforeseen crisis uh, is going to boil up this summer and explode into some sort of rupture. And we're going to look back uh, and be like, well, of course that was what it was going to be. It was always <laughs> going to be that particular thing, but only because of <laughs> hindsight. Um, and, and I think that that speaks to the sort of um, – the beauty and the joy of revolutionary spontaneity of, of, of like responding to a moment, um, and to, um, being prepared, uh, to enter into, um, and alongside of, uh, social movements as they, uh, emerge organically, um, and trying to, uh, not steer them, but, but, but serve them into such a way that they can, um, instigate truly transformative, um, and revolutionary, uh, ruptures in the existing society so that we can get free. Yeah. You know, um, I, I just was really happy to see all that happening over the summer. And it led me to, um, a, basically like, I guess, rededicating myself to familiarizing myself with, uh, not just uh, revolutionary theory, but also stuff within the black radical tradition, uh, you know, reading uh, like Blood in My Eye and uh, Soledad Brother and stuff like, uh, you know, revolutionary suicide and soul and ice and and all of that stuff. And I, I think that, um, you know, like I even read that uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates book, Between the World and Me, um, at that mm-hmm. point too. Um, but I, you know, I, I think that, and I was just, telling somebody about this is that like you know i i we, before we got on air before we press record i was telling you about how i had just dropped my car off at the mechanic and there was a bit of like casual racism he was espousing you know and um and so i engaged him in speaking to him about trying to shift his views to stop with the or to shift it from like blaming individual moral failings and instead place those blames and problems at the feet of capitalism at the feet of the system um and uh and i thought man you know like if i wasn't unemployed and uh and and really like nobody's doing well right now you know but like if i had some extra scratch man i would get a copy of that book and hand it to him just as like a hey this is transformative this has enriched my life and this has helped widen my my views um and I think that if we could get something similar to that with people, I mean, there has to be a dialogue at this point. You know, there's too many people that are on the other side of the fence to not have an ongoing dialogue. And, and there's also like a part of a more robust people's movement is inclusive of the working class that is just very, I guess, lumpen right now. That is conspiratorially thinking uh, a more robust people's movement would include um more members of the working class, however disenfranchised or alienated or isolated th- these people are. Um, so, yeah, I mean, what I'd, what I'd like to see, and as a source of optimism, because, like, you know, the George Floyd thing was very optimistic and stuff, but, like, maybe for the first time today, it, it was, I was like, man, if can we just buy each other books? Like, short books. Like, you know, <laughs> like the, Between the World and Me is, like, I think it's less than 100 pages. You know, um, yeah. like the fire next time is a couple hundred pages. You know, that's an eight-hour audio book. Um, right. And I and I think that maybe maybe there's hope for us if we can if we can come together like we did last summer, and if we can just give each other something to read that can be really be beneficial, um, and not in like a I know not everybody reads all the time, not everybody has time for it and stuff. Um, But I also don't think that we're willing and ready to give up on people right now, too. You know, so, yeah. yeah. No, and I think if this moment says anything, it's that we can't give up on on people and can't give up on each other. And, um, you know, that our only, (laughs) you know, there's no one coming to save us. And it's only going to be us, um, just like it always has been. Um, And I think that, you know, a moment of crisis like this um, where... So many people have died and so many people have suffered um, and so many people are grieving and mourning. It, 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 it behooves us as revolutionary-minded people to 
set aside our hubris and our, our sense of moral superiority for like just two goddamn seconds and just meet people where they're at and their grief. That's walking a mass line, man. Yeah. You know, and uh, just try and be uh, the, the Zapatistas have that, 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 that saying, um, lead by obeying, um, and, and just being present and being willing to, um, not intercede on behalf of others, but like just be with people in their grief. Yeah. Um, I think is, is really crucial. Um, and, uh, it's not going to be easy and it's going to suck ass and it's going to be sad and it's not going to be, uh, you know, um, comfortable. <laughs> but I think that if, if we can find ways to, to meet people where they are, um, and go to people um, with humility, not with a not with a program, not with a five step plan to to change the world, but just meet people where they're at and and shut the fuck up for two seconds and listen. I think that uh, we might just have a chance. Yeah, I mean that's basically what it is: is meeting people where they are. Um, and I mean, if you're a communist, if you're a revolutionary, what are you doing if you're not meeting people where they are? You know, like, like <laughs> whose, whose revolution are you defending or, you know, what is that revolution if you're not siding with the least of these, you know? So, 100%. yeah, man, definitely. Well, Jules, this has been a, uh, a lovely conversation. I'm glad that, uh, we could connect and shoot the shit. Um, it's been fun thinking through, uh, <laughs> maybe fun's the wrong word, <laughs> but it's been, it's been enlightening thinking through, uh, this last hell year, this existential crisis. Yeah. Um, so thanks for, thanks for chatting with me. I didn't even thank you at the top of the conversation, but thank you for having me on brother. I, I, I appreciate it. I love your podcast. I love what you do. Oh, thank and you. Uh, I'm just, you know, I'm flattered to be here and, and I appreciate it. And so, yeah, dude, of course. Well, I'm glad, um, I'm glad we can, uh, we can officially collab. Yeah. Um, for for uh, Coffee with Comrades listeners who might be listening to this in our feed, where can people go to check out No Easy Answers? Uh, the same place where you go to get Coffee with Comrades will no doubt have No Easy Answers. Um, I don't have a website. Just search Jules Taylor, No Easy Answers. And uh, you can find me talking a lot on No Easy Answers. And, uh, and also, like, Google my music, man. I forget that I'm a musician, uh, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's been like a year that you haven't played yet. You have oh all those God. beautiful guitars back oh, there yeah, behind you. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I um, it's it's crazy, man. To like to, it's like every now and then I pick up a guitar again. And I'm like, oh, I was I was pretty good at this stuff. That's right. I I still. <laughs> Like I, I'm so alienated from myself that I'm like, shit, right. man. Like, um, but that's the thing, man. Is that like with 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 you know mass death happening around you. I just, there was something about music that felt a little insufficient to me. Um, and so I, I felt like we were entering, entering a very tumultuous time where there's going to be a lot of uh, needed, difficult conversations. And so no easy answers is me just trying to do my part to help and assist and facilitate that type of dialogue. Fuck yeah. Hell yeah. Well, uh, if folks are listening to this in the uh, no easy answers feed, uh, like Jules said, you can find Coffee with Comrades wherever you find no easy answers. That's the beauty of podcasts. <laughs> I suppose it's kind of a silly question, but it's worth it's worth reiterating. Um, but yeah, uh, Jules, this has been has been fun. Uh, again, I, I keep using that word. This has been therapeutic. Oh, it's been cathartic. Cool. You know. Yeah. Cool. But uh, yeah, comrade, you be well. Um, solidarity and um, try, try your best to stay sane out there. Yeah, man. Solidarity, brother. Thank you. And that about does it for this week's episode of Coffee with Comrades. This is an entirely DIY show run by workers for workers. If you like what you hear, you can follow us on Twitter at CoffeeWComrades and Instagram at Coffee with Comrades. Check out our website, www.coffeewithcomrades.com, and sign up to support our work with a monthly contribution by going to www.patreon.com forward slash Coffee with Comrades. You can find Coffee with Comrades on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you go to get your anti-capitalist propaganda. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. While you're there smashing that subscribe button, be sure to rate and review the show as well to help us increase our reach. 
And that about does it for this episode of No Easy Answers. Again, thank you for listening. Be sure to check out Pearson's show, Coffee with Comrades. I really can't, uh, you know, express how much it was just my treat, my honor to be on his show. I'm really happy that we got to have that conversation. And um, if you are still listening, my dear listener, at this point in the show, um, I have a bit of a treat for you. In the spirit of reflection, since we're looking back at the last year, I, and I normally don't do this, right, but I... I'm going to include and play for you in just a minute uh, a demo that I made here at my house um, when this pandemic was just starting and a lot of things were up in the air and everything was uncertain. And this was a song that I wrote that I recorded in my spare bedroom in the same place where I record this podcast. And, you know, I don't usually spread these demos around very far. And like I said, I don't usually even include my own music in this podcast. Um, but I thought, why not? You know, normally normally I would uh, insert outro music here, but this is my show, I suppose, and I can do what I want. So, um, you know, thank you again. Any questions, comments, concerns, vitriol, send it to noeasyanswers at gmail. Check out our Patreon if you would like to become a monthly subscriber. It really does help us out. And, um, you know, depending on what kind of feedback we get, maybe I'll put some more demos in here. So here is what I'll leave you with for today. Uh, this is a home demo I did. Nothing uh, too uh, production-wise crazy. Uh, this is just me playing a few instruments. Uh, this is called Darker Days. I wish this was an airplane Just bumps along the way Just Flying might be scary But people do it Every day Certain these darker days will